So um, we have a nice set of uh, several lightning talks to be given by your fellow DebConfers. Uh, I'm going to be doing the timing here. Um, if you're giving a lightning talk and you see this, just divide by 10, OK? <laughs> and that's divide by 10, and then that's it. So sorry, this is a, I, if somebody has a marker, we can put a little dot here, because I don't think we need these anymore beyond today. Um, so right, so uh, basic rules for the lightning talks. You get one minute to fiddle with your laptop and try to hook it up to the projector. And after that, I start the clock. Um, or as soon as you start presenting, I start the clock. Uh, if you want to give me slides beforehand targeting 1024 by 768 display, you can do that. But you should have probably already done that by now, because um, I'll be displaying it on um, the screen. So uh, yeah, without further ado, it's five minutes per talk. Um, and it's, uh, we have Tom Marble, uh, which is, the title is Freedom Lost in Cashless Alternatives. Um, so, sorry. Great, thank you. So uh, I wanted to just give you a couple of uh, thoughts about cash. Uh, you probably know about cash, you know, what it is and what we use it for. Um, the main thing that I want to highlight to you is cash is actually a very old idea. It's an abstraction that comes from the 13th century. And the really important part of it is that it's a way of representing uh, faith in this abstract value, which ultimately is about trust. And that's what I think is the theme I want to uh, highlight for you. Um, but cash is under attack. Um, why is that? Well, it turns out that um, it's, uh, it's expensive to process, even though you would think it maybe it isn't, but just storing it and uh, keeping it secure is expensive. Um, people are concerned about germs, it's dirty. But most importantly, it's anonymous. Um, and that doesn't help you if you want to do uh, analysis or profiling or advertising uh, to people. Um, it's not taxed. Governments don't particularly like that. And of course, it can be used for nefarious purposes. Um, but in our world, we love freedom, and you know, really, it's anonymous uh, anonymity for the purpose of free speech, but also being able to choose if we want to be tracked or profiled or if we don't. And so these are kind of some of the values that we believe in. You may notice that people that believe strongly in freedom might have a beard. Well, I, I feel that way, and if you want to express that, uh, because Debian has a diversity statement, I want you to know that if you don't have a beard, it's still possible. Um, it's possible to get a freedom beard accessory, so you can also express your, your feelings about freedom. Well, w what people are proposing, uh, companies are proposing as a replacement for cash, are things that extend credit cards, for example, and in particular using mobile phones, near field communications, and so on, um, as a way of handling money. They want you to use. Uh, your mobile phone as a monetary exchange point. Um, and that's interesting, for, except for a couple of things. It requires being online. Uh, you do not have any privacy or anonymity. And of course, this is built on a completely non-free stack. That's not what we believe in. So other alternatives are uh, similar in that uh, they want you to use your phone as a means of buying things at, with merchants. Uh, again, the problem is, uh, how can we possibly, uh, try, we, how can we get to a point where we can make a choice about the kind of speech that we're making or make choices about how much information we expose about our buying habits if we're not relying on a free stack? This is a problem that we're facing all over the place. So um, other ways of, that are being proposed to handle money include uh, Facebook credits, um, one that I want to call your attention to is M-Pesa. The interesting thing here is it's all about SMS. And the key part about SMS is using this as a way for identity. Another idea that's in mind uh, that's being used in Japan is biometrics and specifically vein uh, identification. Again, really used for identification. Um, uh, you've probably heard of Bitcoin. I think there's some controversy about whether Bitcoin actually provides an anonymity or not. I'm not going to cover that. You probably know a lot about it. This is the graph of my uh, PGP signature tree. Um, I think it's interesting that if money is an abstraction revolving on trust, maybe there's a way that we can use this somehow. 
Um, and I wanted to point you to the latest issue of IEEE Spectrum that has several interesting articles about uh, cash and cash replacements and what's being proposed. Um, it's online. If you uh, search for IEEE Spectrum, uh, you'll, I think it's the June issue uh, that is ca called The Last Days of Cash. One minute. Okay. So the point of this talk was there are some issues affecting our free speech and our ability to be profiled or not, and I just wanted to uh, leave you with this idea that maybe what would it be like if we could have a kind of currency that was allowed us anonymity, um, allowed it to be digital, ideally having it be offline. I realize that that's extraordinarily difficult, um, but I just wanted to put that idea out there. Thank you very much. 30 seconds. All right. Thank you, Tom. Uh, next up, we have uh, Don Armstrong. Um, and his, discuss his talk is called Control at Submit Time. And uh, Don, are you ready? Yeah, yeah do you have my slide? I do, yeah. Awesome. Um, I'm not sure how you were so small, but um, and go. Okay, so I thought I'd really quickly present to you all some of the stuff that I've been working on um, on Debugs while I've been here. Uh, one of the things that I've been fixing is some of the UTF-8 madness that I introduced in order to allow for retitling of UTF-8 uh, bugs, which led to then some double encoding issues. Um, so I've started fixing them. There's some issues hanging around that I still haven't cleaned out, but most of it should be working properly. Um, but what I wanted to talk about really quickly here is control at submit time. So one of the things that uh, frustrates some people who are operating remotely is if you want to advance the next slide, is um, the fact that you have to wait for a round trip time from submit when you're sending a bug to the BTS. Um, and so because of that, not every single thing that you can do with the control interface can be done at submit time. There's some things that you can set via pseudo headers like tags and versions and stuff like that but you don't have the full scope of the uh, control command interface at submit time. So what that means is that you have to wait for a round trip for a bug to come back to you in order to figure out what its bug number is so that you can then turn around and run the uh, exact control command that you wanted to run. So this fixes that. Uh, I mean, the round trip is three minutes, but which is short, but that means that you have to think about it again, and it's obviously not sh that short if you're on a plane when you're working or something like that, or a train, or your network connection is bad. Um, so the solution is to abstract out all of control, uh, basically into a module, lots of code and testing to do this, but if you go to the next slide. this is the part that you actually care about, how you use it. So you just send a bug to submit your package, your version, the same thing you normally do. The only difference is now there are additional uh, pseudo headers called control colon, and it looks exactly like, because it's exactly the same as the control information. The only things you can't do here, you can't send control commands that do things that normally happen at request that, like asking for a list of bugs or anything silly like that. You also currently can't set user tags this way, but you can do that using pseudo headers. But every other control command you know about works the same way. Uh, negative one, the bug negative one, like you probably using clone, is pre-populated for you to be the bug that you're currently emailing. This means that you can do crazy things like send the same message to a bunch of bugs and run the exact same control command affecting different bug numbers. Uh, it works, but that might be insane, so you might not want to do that. Um, anyway, so that all works the way you expect. Um, oh, one last thing that I just announced earlier today on my blog. Um, uh, I was asked last night by Neil that we needed a, a something like what bts.turnzimmer.net gave us, the ability to track what the current status of a bug is, i.e., you're currently working on it, I'm blocked at this point, oh, we don't care about this bug because it'll be fixed by somebody, uh, or I have no idea what to do with this bug, it, it eats uh, children or something. Um, so that sort of information that we used to have, you can now set via a uh, control command called Outlook. Uh, the reason why it wasn't called status is because the BTS uses status internally, and that would be uh, really, really complicated. But you can now do things like outlook, not good, 
for the bug and it will uh, enable you to set that. Eventually I plan to expose that on the bug status page um, which only gets rebuilt every three minutes but eventually it'll be displayed up to the minute with some JavaScript nastiness so that you can check that out. Uh, have one minute left. Okay, uh, I was gonna ask for questions but I don't think there's enough time in lightning talks. So if you have questions, feel free to ask me afterward and if you find bugs, uh, please file them in the normal place against debbugs or bugs.debian.org. Thanks. Anyone have a question in 50 seconds? Yes, Neil. It, yes, it works. Neil asked, does it work for block? And the answer is yes, it works for block. It works for absolutely everything except for user tags. All right. Thank you, Don. <laughs> um, next up is Vagrant. So he's got a minute to fiddle around with the projector. What do you need? That's going to be hard for me to use because I'm actually going to use the rest. Here. Uh, let me turn it on. Fly. Er. Okay. Um, well, uh, I'm going to be talking to you about how I became the Chemium maintainer. Uh, well, a Chemium maintainer. Uh, so, many of you know the boot, the bootstrap. Uh, there's this cool package that I helped get into the archive called Chemium user static, which uses bin format support uh, to do crazy things with cross architecture to root. Um, hopefully, it's building one as we speak. Good. Because I don't have a lot of time for this. Um, but, nah. So basically, uh, what this does is it uses uh, the bin format support uh, in, and calls uh, the, the Kimi user static uh, package uses bin format support to register binaries of various architectures with the kernel so that seamlessly, uh, without having to do anything, uh, when uh, you ask to execute a binary that is for uh, a different architecture, um, basically this is just the list of all the processes running with the Kimu arm static process uh, prepended to it. Um, so this just uh, figures it all out through magic that I don't fully personally understand, but I'm glad other people do. Uh, and then uh, anytime you run a binary that, that uh, matches a certain architecture pattern, it just seamlessly figures out which uh, Kimu emulator to uh, prepend that with. And this has some great advantages. Um, this is a pathetic little netbook, uh, which um, basically we're just doing a debootstrap here. And uh, one of the really nice things about this is that things like file system calls uh, don't have to be emulated. So those are running at native speeds, um, which is really great when you're running on a crappy little netbook like this. Um, but uh, things that need to be emulated, system calls specific for the ARM architecture or whatever, or whatever uh, architecture you may be running, uh, those actually do need to get emulated. Um, and basically, uh, fairly soon now, uh, we should actually have a root available. And, well, yeah, unless you're lightning talk here. Sure. Um, so, yeah. Any questions on what's going on here? Which package do I have to install to get this? Ah, yes. The, uh, the three I listed earlier. Uh, you'll need dbootstrap, key user static, and bin format support. Uh, and then there's a wrapper around a bootstrap called Kimu to bootstrap, crazy though it may be. Um, somebody else actually wrote that part, um, but, uh, and uh, basically you can call that, and uh, as long as bin format support is installed, I think it's a recommends on Kimu user static. Uh, basically, uh, that's all you need for that. And uh, any other questions about this magic? I'm hoping we'll get to the punchline at the end. 
I've timed it very precisely, <laughs> multiple times. Um, although I may have made a mistake. <laughs> yeah. Let's see here. No, that should be about right. So, so we're waiting. Any other thing? How are people liking DevConf? <laughs> right, good, good. One minute. <laughs> so I timed this out a number of times, and it ranged anywhere between four minutes and forty four minutes and thirty three seconds was my best time, and uh, five minutes and one second, which was less ideal. And it took me a few seconds to actually get started on that, so we'll see if it actually makes it in time. Um, it was very helpful to use the min base uh, variant of the bootstrap. Uh, that shaved off at least two minutes. Um, but yeah, uh, well, why don't I show you? Yeah, let's just go up a bit here. Uh, so that's the command there uh, that I basically ran here. Uh, I built my own little archive, and it's all in a tempfs. Um, but that should really uh, help speed things up. And this is just a little Atom processor. Um, let's see here. And I'm installing it in Optel TSP because for this pathetic little thing. Aha! The punchline. OK. Four minutes, 35 seconds. Excellent. So if you'll notice, uh, uname returns a 686-based a, uh, a kernel. But then you'll notice off to the side, you've got ARMB7L. Crazy. It's running ARMHF. And I guess time's up. A nail biter. <laughs> All right, Franklin is up next. Oh, yeah, yeah. So Franklin's talk will be digging popcorn data. Do you want the headset mic or the? Oops, voila. Um, I guess everyone knows about Popcorn. Um, I was trying to do a nice tune like this, which helps know um, which pack package is new and which package is removed in a distribution compared to another, and do some uh, more clever stuff uh, comparing uh, if it's a new source package or a new binary package on anywhere. The important thing is, Come back here. Where's my mouse? Uh, it's here. Sorry, we don't see it very nice. Uh, it's a stars with um, uh, popularity of the package: uh, four stars, three stars, two star, two stars, and so on. Bigger fonts. Bigger. Well, really, it's just a tool to help uh, write the release notes and stuff like that. Uh, but it's not the point. So uh, to make this uh, and have those popularity here, um, I have to get, dig into uh, Popcorn. Um, and actually, that's where we go. I'm not going to go get into the details, but we all know that Popcorn has quite some biases, um, blah, blah. Uh, because it's not installed all the package. Um, is it better? Um, I hope it's good enough. Well, it, it does have quite some, um, some biases, so the data which comes out of Popcorn are uh, to be taken with uh, lots of care. But anyway, let's go on. Um, here is the interesting part. Uh, it's probably a view of popcorn you've never had, uh, which really tries to uh, turn uh, the curve so it's a, it's a other way. It's the list of packages. So this graph was made two years ago, sorry about that. So we have 2,000 packages, 22,000 packages. 
And as we can see here, we have a very narrow amount of package, which are actually very popular. At that time, we had only 80,000 reports, and only about 2,000 packages are actually very popular, as you can see on this curve. Um, the remaining of the package are much lower. For reference, I've put it uh, DPKJ, which is obviously on all the systems. Uh, it's 80,000 80, system. X server, that's one of the biases. Uh, 80, 50 server, 50,000 server uh, run X server. It's probably not uh, the market share of uh, Debian uh, in the servers. Um, Apache is on 80, half of the machine. Bind is running on 40,000 machine. Um, so really, we have very few packages which are installed on lots of systems. Um, we can switch to a logarithmic view. And uh, again, uh, we can uh, still see that some packages which are installed on very, very few systems, like uh, GForge, has only 10 popcorn, but I guess, well, GForge is quite useful. Don't make, don't make wrong, wrong assumption. It's not because the package is not popular that uh, it's not useful. And then digging into it, uh, there's another other interesting facts that I wanted to show uh, in this presentation. Uh, it's that this is again for Lenny. Uh, Okay, um, we have here 1,500 package. Uh, if you process, I've done this by processing uh, dependency. Uh, this is on theory system, not on real system. Um, actually, Debian installer would install more package because of blah, blah, blah. Uh, because of the localization file, the Linux kernels, um, and lots of more stuff. Um, yes. And so if you ever have to make some popularity thing, you probably want to use a logarithmic one. Four star is really for package installed on 90% of the package. Uh, three star is for 9% of the package, 9% of the system. Um, well, um, that's basically what I wanted to show, uh, the correlation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Franklin. Uh, next up is Tincho. Um, are you okay with that mic? Uh, yes. Okay, you can uh, point at me when... Now it's my turn to spend the minute fiddling here with the projector. Um, so well, I'm going to talk about this project of mine I've been working a couple of years ago when I was working in academia. So it's a bit of publicity for my pet project that I found that be, can be quite interesting for system administrators and maybe for some people in Debian. So there's some free publicity at DevConf. <laughs> so the name of this project is Nemo. Um, um, it's a small Python library. It's self-contained that it can be used to create emulated networks, which is an academic term for virtual networks that can be controlled for throughput or packet loss and whatever, so they can emulate a real network. Uh, that can be used to run, run tests, experiments that can be completely automated or interactive, and more importantly, that it can be repeated, so you can create a script that will run uh, supposedly uh, the, uh, in the same fashion everywhere. Um, being able to show your test and um, automate it, put it maybe in your package. So it's a byproduct of research because it was just a side pro uh, project we did in 2010. And then after a couple of years, I found that, oh, this is interesting for my system administration tasks. Okay. So a few use cases I think can be interesting. Say you want to test an application that needs many many nodes, and you don't want to configure 50 QMO nodes and do a lot of things. So you can just run five, 50 instances in your machine. Also, it's very lightweight since it runs um, in, in one kernel that is only using the network containers isolation to simulate the different nodes. 
<coughs> you can use it to observe behavior in unreliable networks. As, saying, as I was saying, you can configure throughput or packet loss, packet delay, reordering. It's using just TC rules of this em network emulation rules. Um, you can justify some changes you're doing to some project or some protocol by testing and with the, the same script you can run af uh, before and after and show that there's a change and it's easy to reproduce so you don't do any, uh, a lot of manual work. Uh, so this fourth use case, this fourth use case was the one uh, I found which was I, was, I needed to do a change in a production network and it was quite disruptive and it was in, a, in, a, it was in the main firewall. So I just copied all the configuration into one script and run it and make sure that nothing will break and that all the applications kept on working. And, and yeah, the last point is that you can, uh, it's easy to distribute because you can just put in one script on just a small collection of scripts and there is no other thing to be distributed, just a Python script. So this is how it looks like. This, uh, this small script runs. I just tested it before coming here. Um, you see, you create a few nodes. Uh, you configure kind of interface, set them up, add IP addresses. You can also configure routing, whatever. And then just you can tell it to run a command in the node. So you can also op open an X term because there is support for X and just do stuff, run TCP dump, whatever, and works pretty nicely. So. <clears throat> there are some useful links if you're interested. Uh, this, the first one is the main project we were working on when this w was spawned, uh, which is a bigger tool for mostly for uh, academia, it's for experimentation, but it's nicer because it has a GUI and can do some more abstract de uh, definition of the network. The second one is a project I just learned about two weeks ago that is more or less the same idea, <laughs> and it was developed at the same time. Uh, but I think it's quite more, uh, more heavy. Um, and well, they have the homepage they have the two projects and where to find these slides and the code I, I used to run some tests. One minute left. One minute left? One minute left. Wow, that's, I was speaking too fast. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I cannot show you much. <laughs> so anybody wants, has some question, somebody's interested in knowing about it or maybe contributing? All right. Well, that was a short one. Thank you, Tincha. Um, so, uh, may I have a blog to talk later? Yes. Okay. Um, so next up, we have Edgar uh, doing a talk on Yorome. Um, I think he's going to set up his network connect his video. Is there a live network cable? Yes, there is. There's video. Do you want a headset or do you want the standing oh, mic? Whichever you prefer. You should focus on Finland. Yeah, it's coming up. We're in the video fiddling grace period. And the grace period is about to expire. And the grace period is up. Well, I'll start. Oh, uh, all right. No network, uh, so, but I'll put the, I'll put this this file up on Gobi as soon as I have network access. Um, so I I uh, I've started a little project uh, with some people from my group. It's called uh, Your M. Uh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should just turn off the network. Anyway. Uh, 
Um, the name Yoreme is the name of an ethnic group in the north of Mexico. Um, why did we choose this name? Sorry? Uh, okay, fair enough. There, am I good? Ah, bigger, oh shit, sure. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, better? Bigger? Your time is running short. Oh, okay. So anyway, um, it's, it's intended, uh, intended for kids with uh, low exposure to uh, computers and networks. Um, but really, the, 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 the content created should be uh, usable by anyone at, at, at the appropriate level. Um, the, that's the, that's the, the, the URL of the, of the, of the project. Um, the, the word educare comes from Latin. Latin had two uh, words for education, educare and educare. Um, one, the one that I chose for the, for the URL, uh, means to, uh, to bring out the potential in someone, as opposed to educare, which means to shape someone in uh, presumably some way which you find advantageous. Uh, and, and well, I chose this word because uh, the, the point being to, uh, to create a corpus of, uh, of, of, of educational content which is in the form of a, of a knowledge tree, uh, so that people can explore it uh, through, through self-directed uh, study. Um, it, it, it's supposed to be task or achievement based. That means uh, we, we teach through, uh, through doing, through achieving certain tasks, through creating uh, content, digital content. This can be text, uh, code, images, video, audio. Uh, we're not interested in, 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 in grading, we're not interested in, in judging what people create. We're basically interested in giving people a voice because uh, there's a peril with computers uh, in, in a sense of uh, big business tends to try to, uh, to, to push this uh, dichotomy between uh, content creators and consumers. And, and we think the only way to, uh, to oppose this is by uh, trying to make everybody, uh, in, uh, you know, try to, to help everybody be able to create uh, whatever uh, style of content um, they, they like, they enjoy, to giving them a voice uh, so that they can do more than just uh, listen or, or absorb. Um, and, and, and then, uh, we, uh, we, we use this, uh, this uh, style of activity called a format. Uh, this is taken from the, the language acquisition uh, community. Formats are, are very rigid interactions. Uh, I, th I think the, the, the very most basic example is Peekaboo. Very rigid interactions uh, where uh, the, the rigidity of the interaction... One minute to go. Okay. Um, the rigidity of the of the interaction uh, lets the the child infer much. Um, so basically, uh, in in a format, you you ask the, the kids to go and, and 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 do something and report back, or you ask them a question that that they can solve through interaction. The idea being to minimize the information transfer, like do this, do that, explanations, nothing like that, just. Uh, try this out and, and learn uh, through interaction. I'm done? 30 seconds. Well, and the last thing is we, we have this up. This is an alias that, uh, that just redirects to Wikiversity. We're putting up this up in Wikiversity, so it's available for everyone. It's uh, free by default. Um, that's pretty much it. I think my time's up. And your time is up. Yep. Questions? Thank you, Edgar. Thank um, you. We have a uh, lightning talk from Andrew next. Um, you're up. Uh, oh, 
You want a headset mic or? <coughs> Do you need the projector? Yes. Come over here. <coughs> it's not very comfortable. Right. Hello? Is that okay? Yep. You ready to start? Everybody hear me? Okay, I just want to talk about uh, how uh, people think difficultly to come to DevConf. I want to share my experience last year in Bosnia because I noticed that uh, uh, one year before was in New York, New York and I think that uh, I can apply the visa in New York City to get uh, something. But uh, people say, no problem, just uh, they will arrange something because the government sponsored uh, DevConf. So I was very happy and uh, talk with the visa, DevConf team, and it says, no problem. But I noticed that I have to go to uh, Hungary to apply visa there. So my flight was uh, uh, start a trip with Anna together from uh, Taiwan. And we go, uh, uh, the, uh, go fly via Beijing to get uh, Munich. And from New York, we enter uh, Hungary, and we try to get a, a visa in Hungary. But in the time that the, uh, the visa team says, it's good news that you don't have to uh, get visa layer because the, your visa already granted by the government. So um, I just uh, go to Hungary still, but for sizing, because I was planning to apply visa, but it's things I don't have to apply, so I go sizing. And then I went uh, uh, to Bosnia via Croatia, and then I, uh, in Croatia border, they check my passport. Uh, but somehow my passport they don't recognize. So they say, uh, can I bring this passport and the check and be right back? And this guy leave the chain, and the chain was leaving. <laughs> and my passport was still in the, in the border control. And I just noticed that, that uh, uh, the, the, the guy on, on the chain, they say, uh, uh, please stop the chain because my passport was still in the border control. <laughs> I haven't gotten my passport. And then they try to uh, make a handbrake on the chain, but the driver still moved the chain. <laughs> and then the guy just opened the door and tried to move funny movement out of the door to notice the driver, please stop, stop, stop the chain. And then finally that driver noticed and the chain back forward to the station. So the whole chain was delayed because my visa, uh, because my passport. And the, the guy was very sorry that uh, <laughs> he forgot my passport. And then all the, the, the passengers on the, on the train noticed me that uh, when we cross the next border to Bosnia, please notice the border control, remember the passport. <laughs> okay, then uh, we arrived. Uh, it was very long because we need to wait for the, for the, for the car, for, for the train. So uh, here we go, we arrived to Bosnia, right? And this time, uh, they ask me to go down the chain. And then I, I give them the, a letter prepared by the DevConf team, which is written in their native language, but somehow there's a language problem or something. They don't even make a phone call. They think it's fake or something. They ask me to take my luggage, everything, get off the chain, and took me back from the, the other direction. I thought that they would probably want to send me back to Croatia. So I tried to make a phone call to Vinimir and tell him that the, the problem. So he tried uh, to talk with the, the, the border control as well. And they talked about five minutes, tried to make him believe it's, it's real, it's not fake. So uh, I was waiting in border control. It's because they said, where is my visa? I couldn't see that on my, on my passport. So I was waiting there uh, until they, they make a phone call. I'm not sure where they, they reach, uh, how, how they solve the problem, but probably that they phone the phone call to the president office. So the president office uh, make a phone call or something and then realize that uh, I'm not a uh, crime, you know. So they give me some Coke to drink. <laughs> it was really nice. And then I was waiting there for about like four hours. And 
Yeah, it, it, this was a guy with the three stars with the trace was there talking and says, please wait. And then another guy shows up, even without any of the promo shoot, but thinks that he's the boss, higher position than the three stars guy. And he says, I'm pretty sorry that we have a technical problem because we have a Windows machine was broken since 2008. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then, and, then, and then he said that, uh, uh, yeah, very sorry that and I'm, I'm, I don't use Windows crap. I Ubuntu user. And then I just told that uh, uh, I'm Debian developer and uh, Anna also work in Ubuntu for so those kind of things. He says it's real and, and he thinks that uh, impossible for him because uh, he really sees a Debian developer in his personal life. So he was really happy to grant my visa by handwriting. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then he said uh, he wants to arrange a hotel for us. And I said, no, we have hotel already in the venue, but the border to the venue is 180 kilometers away. He says, okay, wait a minute, and he arranged a trans special transportation, which has uh, blue and red eyes, lights <laughs> on that, <laughs> and driving uh, so fast, like 140 kilometers per hour on the mountain road. <laughs> and then two and a half hour later, I arrive. <laughs> That's my trip. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. That's, uh, if you thought you had a hard time getting to DevConf, um, we'll take another lightning talk from you. But I think that one might top it. So that's actually our last lightning talk, unless someone has a one last minute talk, which is about all we have time for. Uh, any um, last minute ones? OK, in uh, uh, 15 minutes, there should be the closing ceremony here. Um, and uh, yeah, so stick around. And thank you, everybody, for coming to DevConf.